true or false, your first uh, voice acting gig was basically in exchange for the promise of food? Yes. That's the only reason I did it. Uh, I had no interest in acting at all. I was a, a struggling musician in the 80s playing in an R&B band, the only R&B band in town at the time, opening for heavy metal acts. And so you can imagine how well that was going. Um, we had cheeseburgers thrown at us and our gear sabotaged, but I, I loved it. I just wanted to do something in entertainment. And uh, as a day job to help support that, I worked in a mail room at a film company because I, I thought that would be cool. Uh, it was a company called Empire Entertainment. We made movies like Reanimator and Ghoulies and things like that. Yeah, I was with that company for 15 years. But while I was in the mailroom, uh, the head of the mailroom, a guy named Victor Garcia, was casting for a Japanimation program. And <laughs> that's what we called it back then for you kids. Uh, <laughs> and uh, he wanted everybody in the studio to come and audition for it. And everybody in Hollywood, everybody in Los Angeles is an actor, except for me, I think. <laughs> And uh, I didn't want to do it. And he said, but you have the deepest voice in the mailroom and we need a, a guy who can do creatures. And I said, well, I can growl, but I don't, I'm not an actor, dude. And he said, I'll give you free breakfast and lunch. <laughs> and I said, oh, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, I'll do that. that. That's cool. They're not gonna hire me anyway, but I, I want pizza. <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, they, they uh, had us come to a studio on a Saturday morning and we had to haul all the gear up into a tree house because that's where the studio was. And uh, it was this rock dude, crazy, long-haired, wild ape man uh, who had this studio up in a treehouse, and he didn't have the proper gear to record for Japanimation programming. He didn't know, nobody knew how to do it back then. Uh, but one of the requirements for the free food was that we had to haul the equipment up there and help him set it up, um, which I was glad to do because I was starving. <laughs> and uh, so we set up this studio, and uh, they fed me food, and uh, Eventually, they put me in front of the microphone with this image of a creature on screen, and they said, do that. And I went, I, I, I don't know how. And they said, just, just growl like you do when we're screwing around in the mailroom and, and try to do it in time with a creature ripping the arm off of another creature and beating him with it. And I said, oh, okay, I can do that. Yeah, that's easy. And so I just look at the screen, and I just went, <laughs> and they went, all right, you're hired. And then I went, do I still get pizza? <laughs> and I just kept doing it. It was really fun. We had a great time doing it. They were like, they brought 20 of us in at the same time, which you're not supposed to do when you're recording anime. It's supposed to be one person at a time because we're all a bunch of children in grown-up suits. And it's very hard to manage. And the technicality of syncing everything up is hard enough without having to manage all the idiots running around, you know, trying to outdo each other with Arnold Schwarzenegger impressions. <laughs> Um, but I, I loved it. It was so much fun. I got to hang out with my friends. I did get the free food, and they kept bringing me back. And here I am 30 years later doing this for a living. Who knew? Yeah. That's amazing, yeah. <laughs> Speaking of free food, did you get any hookups uh, uh, when you did the 7-Eleven deal? Not one damn taquito. Oh. Not one. No, I even, when I was, when the 7-Eleven campaign was really going, and I was the guy who said, oh, thank heaven, I was that guy, I actually walked into 7-Elevens from time to time just to see if anybody would recognize me. <laughs> and, <'cause, laughs> and so I said, I'm, I'm the guy who does the voice for the commercials that you're playing in the store here. I, oh, thank heaven. He goes, I don't care. The ta <laughs> taquitos are 49 cents. Would you like one or not? Get out of line. And it was, oh, man never going to be famous in Hollywood, but I didn't get into it for that, but I, I did try that once, and, and it did not work. <laughs> That's amazing. All right, so again, we will have a, a live microphone, uh, but um, I, I, I want to ask uh, before, because I know there's going to be a, a ton of questions, but so I wanted to ask personally, because I, I love uh, Disney, and I love the fact that Disney Plus is coming out on Tuesday, yeah. and, <laughs> and your voice will be heard all throughout uh, Disney Plus. You have a ton of shows. Uh, Wolverine, the X Men, yeah. Avengers. Yeah. Uh, what are your What are your thoughts on that? I'm really excited. I didn't know Wolverine, the X Men is going to be playing. Absolutely. Yes. Oh my god. I looked it up this morning. We might actually get paid for it. That would be amazing. <laughs> uh, honestly, we didn't get paid for that show. So yeah, that, that was that's a whole story. That's a whole other thing. Yeah, but uh, I didn't know that was going to be playing. That's great. So probably Spectacular Spider Man will be on there. I hope. Uh, I think so. I think that, that would, would be one a listed. That'd be cool. And I've been doing some Disney shows now, too, like Tangled and Lion Guard. So yeah, I saw a lot, yeah. Yeah, and Star Wars. So, yeah, it'll be very cool to be part of it. I haven't even looked at the roster. I, gotta, I guess i got to do that. That'd yeah, be kind of uh, cool. It's, it's incredible. So are you going to, like, how many people here are going to get the Disney Plus? 
We, we, we already bought it. You already bought it. Yeah, well, my fiance, Mary Elizabeth McGlynn. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, she directs uh, Star Wars Resistance and uh, Tangled and a bunch of stuff for uh, Disney. So uh, she she bought it so she could watch the shows. And and she's a huge Disney fan anyway, so we're going to be watching all the old Disney movies and things. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, we're excited. All right, so I think we have a question. How you doing? What's your name? Hi, I'm, oh, sit down. Oh, okay. Hi, I'm Katie. Okay. Hi, Katie. If you want to point out, I'm dressed up as the TARDIS, and I'm here because that's how awesome you are. Yes, absolutely. Oh my God. Yeah. I chose you over David Tennant. You are you amazing. Are, Can you I? You are amazing, and I've been a huge fan of yours for a very long time. So. I'm going to totally rub that in on Twitter. I'm gonna, Do it, please. David I follow you on Twitter, so please. Uh, oh sweet. my God, you would make my day if you did that. Thank you. You and I will have to take a picture today, and let's rub it in. Yes. Time, okay? All right. Yes. All right. All right. I would I'll give you a free to one today in the TARDIS. Oh, dress. that's so yeah. awesome. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay, so anyway, so my question is. Um, and I apologize, it is multi-part, but it's kind of a decision tree type question, so uh -oh. it'll make sense. Sounds like math. Uh, <laughs> I, I do, yeah, anyway, I'm a geek, so no. obviously. Uh, <laughs> Love you for it. Thank you. Um, so, okay, first my question is, do you play video games? And if you do, do you play any video games that you have performed in? And if you don't play video games, do you watch any of the shows that you've performed in, for instance, like Cowboy Bebop? Uh, I don't play video games anymore. Uh, because they require opposable thumbs, <laughs> <laughs> and I do not have them. Uh, I am I am an ape who has not evolved. Uh, no, I don't. I don't play them, and partially because partially because of the fact that I would have to learn the systems. Sure. Um, but also, I just don't have time. And I back in the day when I did play video games, I would sit in front of the machine for twelve hours at a time, and I, I ain't got that kind of time yeah. anymore. I think the last video game that I played that I was in was Crash Nitro Kart. Uh, awesome. Just yeah, because it was one of the few games that I could actually play. It wasn't super <laughs> complicated, and and I I had to geek out over just the because <laughs> <"Whoa!" laughs> I, I was a crash I was a crash fan. It's the only time I've ever gotten to play Crash, so I thought that would awesome. be pretty fun. Yeah. So uh, and then in terms of watching the shows, generally the shows that I watch used to be because I was writing for them. I used to write for Digimon and a lot of other shows mm -hmm. back then. Cool. And yeah, Digimon. Woo! <laughs> Thank you for watching Digimon. I appreciate you. Uh, and I had to watch them because I, you know, we, we have to watch them end to end as we're writing them. But um, I watched, uh, I've watched uh, Star Wars Rebels all the way through um, because they set up screenings for us at Disney, and I'm not going to say no to that. Oh, that was God, awesome. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was awesome. And we got to see it before you guys. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> uh, and Transformers Prime I watched all the way through. Because I, I just loved it. Thank you. Don't tell Megatron. Because <laughs> uh, he doesn't care about any of us. Uh, and oh, Wolverine the X-Men, I did watch. Just because I wanted to know what they were doing with it before we got to the next thing. And Spectacular Spider-Man, I think I watched all the episodes of that. But most shows, most anime that I've worked on, I haven't watched yet. I just watched Bebop for the first time all the way from end to end about six or seven months ago. Wow. Yeah, I'm a terrible Whereas fan. I've watched it about... Six or seven thousand times. So. Uh, I'll get there at some point. I will. It's it held up pretty well considering uh, the first couple episodes I was I was watching went. Oh, I could have done that better. I know I did a better take, but but after that I kind of got lost in the story because it's so good. It's still so good. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I wish I had more time to watch the shows, and I'm I'm interested in them. I've seen a couple episodes of Tangled, and I think one episode of Lion Guard. You know, some of the more recent stuff, but. I just don't have time because I'm doing this, or I'm teaching, or I'm doing voice work, so or I'm doing auditions more than anything else. <laughs> when I have a I have a little portable studio that I bring with me. I record auditions every night at the conventions too. I'm doing that seven days a week, so that's really the job more than anything else. I think that's why I work so much is because I audition more than anybody I know. <laughs> I'll say no. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you for that. But uh, auditioning more than anybody also gets you more gigs than anybody, and you actually have a Guinness World Record. Yeah. I don't know how that happened. That was weird. Yeah, you have a Guinness World Record for what? It's a uh, most prolific voice actor, I think it is. In video games in specifically, video games. yeah. I, I, as a kid, I the Guinness Book was a huge thing for us as kids, and I thought I could get it by spitting the farthest or hopscotching, <laughs> but I just I wasn't that good at anything. So <clears throat> when that came along, I was really surprised, uh, and it was a cumulative. Uh, award. It was based on quantity rather than quality. <laughs> um, but I took it. I took it. And it, it was so weird, too. When I got the call from uh, the people in England for the Guinness record, they made me prove that 
uh, their numbers were correct. So I had to sit with my agent, with my IMDb, and it took us like three or four months to go through all the stuff on the IMDb, and I didn't know if they, it was right or not because so much of the stuff that we work on is under a code name uh, when we're doing it. And because I'm not a gamer, a lot of the games came out, I didn't play them. I actually had to ask the fans if I was in it or, <laughs> or, or, or watch videos, and I go, oh yeah, that was me, okay. I, I don't know, I don't know any of that stuff. So uh, the numbers are probably actually a lot higher than, than what they had there, but back in 2012, it was in the 300s, now it's in the 400s. And I have to pr prove it every year. We have to go through that process every year, so. Wow, incredible. But I still have it on my wall and it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> How are you doing, what's your name? Oh, my name is Dublin. Hi, Dublin. Hi, Dublin. Uh, first, uh, was it true that you were Goku in GT Final Bout? Yes, uh, and very embarrassingly so. I, <laughs> I, I forgot that I had done that and a fan came up to my table a year or two ago and showed me some of the footage, and it was like, oh man, that's stilted and awful. But that's the way I was directed at the time, and Sean Schemmel was sitting like two doors down from me, and he, the, the fan handed me this copy of it to sign, and I said, you know what, he's my Goku, maybe he should sign this thing. <laughs> but thank you for, for noticing that, yeah. It was cool just to have played Goku once. Also, I love you as a Mon from Legend of Korra. Thank you, I'm still going to purify you. And, uh, my question is, since Kevin Conroy has been Batman for so many years and you've been Wolverine for so many years, when did you start playing Wolverine? Uh, during X-Men Legends, whenever it was that that came out. Uh, that was the first time I played Wolverine, and every time I've booked Wolverine, I've had to audition again. Uh, so I, I've earned it every single time, and I'm proud of that. But yeah, it's a pretty good gig, Bob. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin Conroy is and always will be my Batman. Hi. Oh, um, I asked this to one of the other voice actors, and I was wondering how you deal with any dialogue that you find particularly funny that you might have to keep yourself from laughing while you're recording. Do you have that issue at all? Uh, I laugh at everything, so <laughs> um, usually I can get through it. I, I, it's, I think it's just training that you know kind of keeps me in balance enough to, to get through it, especially if we're on a time crunch. Um, but if it's funny, they want us to laugh. And, and I think the writers, if they're in the room, they really get a kick out of it if the actors are laughing at their jokes. Uh, so it just makes the whole room a little bit lighter. Th there's not really an issue with that. If something's really funny, I'm gonna laugh. I'm just gonna let it out. And, or, I'll, or I'll do something even more off-putting with a line, <laughs> which I tend to do anyway. And, and sometimes to get around that, I'll just do like a really filthy version of the line just to get that out, get them laughing, and then I can kind of come back to it and get centered again. So there are many shows that uh, there's probably a whole separate track that they could use. Uh, well, they can't use it. They would have to use it for late night programming, but it would be a completely different show. Uh, quite a few shows like that that I, I just can't help myself. So, but thank you for that question. Thank you. Laughter is the best medicine, as Rob Paulson says. Hello. <laughs> Hello, my name Hi. is Matt. Hi. Hi. Um, so you've done a lot of stuff, obviously, you know, everybody knows Spike Spiegel, uh, Boyfriend is Crazy for Starscream. I personally love Yaki Doodle, uh, so very much. <laughs> and thank you for that. Uh, what is run, one role that you are really proud of? It, like, is there a role that you're really proud of that you don't think a lot of people have seen that you wish more people had, you know, been aware of? Uh, that's a great question. Um... I try to be proud of all of them just because I put my heart and soul into everything, but uh, one thing that a, a lot of people hadn't seen was Megas XLR. Uh, yeah, I love Megas XLR. It was such a great show. If you don't know about it, look it up. Um, they're actually doing a panel in Los Angeles with the creators of Megas XLR today, uh, and I can't be there, and I, it just hurts my soul. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was such a great homage to uh, Giant Robot, uh, stuff and anime and action cartoons and everything that is nerdy, everything that all of us love. There was little tidbits of that, all sprinkled all through that, and uh, and a beautifully executed show and hilarious show. And we had an amazing uh, bunch of guest stars that showed on that uh, showed up on that show. And Cartoon Network at the time just didn't know what to do with it. Hmm. It was just such a weird anomaly that they didn't quite know how to market it and ended up using the show as a tax write-off so we couldn't even finish all the episodes that we'd intended to do. Oh. Yeah, so we were trying to get the rights back. I don't know if they're going to ever be successful at that, but 
man, if you haven't seen Megas XLR and you're a giant robot fan, watch that show because it's awesome and stupid and funny. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Matt. Hi. Uh, my question is, since you brought up the Japan Animation era, do you remember the anime bastard when you were a character named Ninja Master Gara? Barely. I remember recording it. Uh, I don't remember anything about the show. I just thought it was cool that I could work on something called Bastard. <laughs> and I could say it in front of my kids just because that was the name of the show. <laughs> uh, oh, really? It's printed right here. You <laughs> also, on the same question, do you remember when you voiced Ken Masters in Street Fighter Alpha? Yeah, because uh, it was Street Fighter, and that was cool. <laughs> thank you. Fight. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Hi, my name's uh, Caleb. Hi. Caleb. Hi. And uh, I was going to ask... Uh, Ever since the beginning of your career, from World at War up to Black Ops 4, did you or any of your fellow voice actors from the Zombies crew have to put yourself through any kind of method acting? Uh, not for me. I like screaming anyway. Did you, um, did you get to record any of your own lines or choose any of your own lines? Um, we probably improved some of it. I'm sure I improved quite a bit of it. Uh, but the writers are so smart and funny and uh, knowledgeable about that world that I would trust them. And if I saw something that I might embellish a little bit, I might have done that. But um, I have been doing military type stuff for quite a while, so I was fairly familiar with it. And I just love saying stuff like, oorah, or splatter those gut bags. You know, that was, it's just fun for me. I, I love all of that. Um, it, it was, the thing that bummed us out a little bit was that the, the cast, especially of Black Ops, uh, my buddies in that crew, we're all friends. We're all really close friends. And we never got to work together. Uh, they would always bring us in one at a time. So at conventions and appearances and stuff, it was, it was really the only time we got to play together to do that until the very end of uh, Black Ops where we did the song. I'm not going to spoil it for you guys, but there's a nice little song at the very end. And they brought us together one last time to have lunch together and to talk about it and show us some footage and stuff. So it was, it was kind of bittersweet, but we became that weird dysfunctional family that you got to know and love in the game. But thank you for playing for the last 10 years, man. Yeah, thank you. All right. Thank you. I need a juggernaut now. Hello. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I just want to say thank you for, so much for coming here to Minneapolis. Great to have you here. And Thank you. Uh, my brother and I are fans of Cowboy Bebop. He especially loves it. And I want to give a special shout out to the episode Sympathy for the Devil and Mushroom Samba. Nice. <laughs> Good choices. Thank you. Thank you. You said you just watched the whole show again just recently, but do you have any like fond memories from when you recorded the show back all those years ago? Yeah, that was my first leading role. So the first probably five or six episodes, I was just terrified every moment of it. I just didn't want to screw it up because the show looked so beautiful. Um, but Mary Elizabeth McGlynn, I'm going to mention her a lot. She's my fiance now, by the way. Uh, <laughs> She was the, the voice director on Cowboy Bebop, on Bebop and also played Julia on the show. And it was her first directing gig. And she, she was such a, a great influence on my life and my career at that time because she held the context for everything for me. And some of the greatest moments really happened in uh, her, her guidance, uh, just getting me through a scene. Um, there were a lot of scenes where Spike was smoking and I had quit smoking cigarettes and she was still a smoker at the time. She would bring cigarettes and she would give me one and she would want me to have it in my mouth. Every time Spike had a cigarette in his mouth, she'd want me to have that cigarette in my mouth. And uh, so I would carefully try to save the cigarettes so I wouldn't you know, take them from her stash every session. And back then, before we had smartphones, we had these big books, calendar books. And I would carefully put the cigarette in a little pouch in there and try to save it for the next session. And every single time, I'd open up the book and a bunch of leaves would fall out because it would just disintegrate in there. And I'd have to sheepishly go, I need another cigarette, I'm sorry. Uh, but she was so sweet about it, um, and, and I just remember moments in the show where she would just stop and she'd go, you, you just have to listen to the music in this scene. I'm not going to show you anything else, but you just have to listen to the music because I want that to get you in the mood for this. And that was the closest to method acting I've ever uh, gotten, I think. But the music was so spectacular in that show, and the visuals were so amazing in that show that every once in a while she would just take the time and let me... Uh, just be enveloped by it before we would do a scene. Um, and the other thing that I remember very distinctly about that was in the movie, uh, there was a scene in the jail cell with Electra. I don't know if you guys remember that. 
where we're talking about pain and lost love and, and that kind of stuff. And it was the first time that Spike really became vulnerable. And uh, it was the first time I had become vulnerable as an actor. Everything else I had done prior to that were crazy creatures and, you know, villains and, and you know, stuff that I... I could go play pretend, but when I had to go to that vulnerable space, I had to actually get vulnerable personally, and that was painful. That was really hard. I was not raised to be that, and she had to put me in that space to do that scene, and I had to think about stuff that hurt, but it changed me as a person, and it changed, I think, my performance in that movie and made me a better actor as a result of that, being willing to go to that place of pain and to find my way back out of it, too. So. Uh, I, I remember very distinctly that moment sitting in the studio when I was confronted by a lot of my fears and anxiety, and I had to work through that, and it, it changed everything for me. From that moment on, I, was, I felt like I was a different person. It's pretty cool. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, that show profoundly effect, affected my life. Hi there. My name is Brayden. Hi. So I'm a big fan of Star Wars. I really enjoyed your work on Rebels, but I'm also a fan of Nazi zombies. So I wanted to know who would win in a fight, Tank Dempsey or Zeb? Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Zeb might fight a little dirtier. <laughs> He's used to bashing bucket heads. But on the other hand, they can't shoot very well. So, <laughs> man, I don't know. Um, everybody always wants to know who would win in a fight. I. I always think the opposite way. Who would drink more beer or something, you know? It, if they go out to a pub together. And I think that Zeb would win in that case. Uh, he's just got a bigger capacity there. So, um, and yeah, Tank would bring out the weapons. He, he'd try, but I think Zeb would probably kick his ass. Zeb is a little more limber. And he's got those prehensile feet too, so. <laughs> thank you. But thank you for watching the show. I appreciate it. May the Yashla be with you. Hello. Hi. All right. Uh, so, if a book, a movie, or anything like that already exists it was, was an animated like adaptation, what would be the one character you want to play? Like anything, like books, movies, TV shows, anything that you could voice. What would the one character you'd choose to be? Oh man, that's a tough question. Uh, you know, that's a really, really hard question for me because I I never think about the stuff that I haven't done. I'm just so grateful for what is happening right now or what, you know, the opportunity that comes up in that moment. Um, that's actually an impossible question for me because I, I think that that's, that's a mistake that a lot of actors make when they're getting into the business is they think, I want to be that character or I want to do that thing. And if they don't do that thing, they see themselves as a failure. And I, there are so many other possibilities that open up if you don't think that way. Um, the one thing that I thought about early on in my career was playing Batman because I thought I had the natural voice print for it. And, uh, and then I hear Kevin Conroy do it, and I went, oh, no, I'm good. It's, it's, okay. <laughs> it's okay. So every time I've come up with something like that, uh, it either hasn't worked out, or um, one of my friends booked, and I'm happy for them, but then I'll book something else that I really didn't see coming, like Wolverine, you know? So I just don't think in, in that way. My brain doesn't function that way. Uh, but, you know, if you guys have any suggestions, I'm open to it. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm available for work on Monday. So. Right, thank you. Thank you. Hi. Hey, my name is Davis. Hi, Davis. So you, you and the other voice actors that started in Cowboy Bebop have, you know, you know, are synonymous to what I believe what Cowboy Bebop should sound like. You know, you guys are the actors. So with the live action coming up, I was wondering if you were offered some kind of cameo role, what role would you like to play in the live action? Literally anything. <laughs> I will wash floors. I don't care. I, I've mentioned a couple times that I'd love to be one of the old men uh, with the planes. I thought that You didn't did. fly that mission, you idiot. I'd, I'd love, because now I'm old and I could do it. You know, that'd be, that'd be super fun. Um, I, I've, I've made it very clear that I'm available and willing to travel uh, if they would bring me in for a cameo. And a few of my friends work on the show. They haven't been able to figure that out yet. So I'm, I'm hoping at some point it works out. Um, I'm even trying to butter up John show and get him to work in my favor. Uh, I, I, st I stalked him on Twitter, and I, I, uh, mainly because I just wanted to say I'm excited that he's given the opportunity to do this. Um, I, I love that he's the casting choice for Spike. I think he's going to do a really great job. It kind of breaks my heart that he got hurt on the set, 
I was actually in New Zealand a couple weeks ago, and I was going to go out to the set and tour it and meet him, and he went home three days before I got there, oh. and they shut everything down. But to their credit, uh, they shut down the whole thing, and they're waiting for him. And it could take seven to nine months before production starts up again. So I'm hoping in that time, A, that he heals, and B, that they change their mind and hire me for something. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, man, I, I hope that people give that a shot. Because uh, I think now that they have the technology and the money behind it uh, to do it right, uh, back in the day when Keanu Reeves was tagged to do the movie, I actually had a conversation with him in an airport, and he said, yeah, the script is phenomenal, but we can't afford to make it. It's going to be like $100 million to make this thing, just because the technology wasn't quite there yet to, to recreate that world. Now I think they could do it, you know, on a sh not a shoestring budget, but much, much less expensively. And, uh, you know, shooting in a place like New Zealand, they have a lot more options too. So I'm, I'm, I have really high hopes for the show. I can't wait for it, honestly, whether I'm in it or not. But please hire me. Please hire me. <laughs> Mugen, you look good. Thank you. So, I truly believe that food is the greatest equalizer when trying to relate to characters or people. So I was wondering, um, what are some of your favorite foods and drinks? And uh, what have you had recently that you really liked? Uh, you got me craving dumplings all of a sudden. I don't know why. <laughs> um, man, I love everything. I love food. I love breakfast, I think, more than anything else. Um, but I cook. I cook a lot. I love a good steak. Sorry, vegetarians. Uh, everybody that I have a, a team that works for me, and almost everybody's a vegetarian or vegan, so they hate when I talk about that. Um, but I, I love to grill, um, so I'm, I'm constantly making cool stuff on the grill. I got a really nice barbecue, so that's probably my favorite thing. Uh, although, when I can tolerate it with my pudge, I love pasta and pizza and stuff like that. But I will eat almost anything except garlic because I have an allergy and Brussels sprouts and uh, asparagus because I can't stand it. <laughs> Just smells like barf to me. <laughs> yes, but I can be tempted with pizza. And then uh, something that you've had recently that you really like? Oh, that I had recently? Yeah. Uh, I haven't eaten much this weekend. It's been so busy. Uh, recently? What did I have recently? Man, I can't even remember the last time I sat down and had a meal. Um, breakfast. I had a good breakfast the other day. I had a, some, just some good old eggs and bacon and toast and hash browns and drippy, greasy stuff like that, yeah. That was a couple days ago, I think. I think I had breakfast a couple days ago, yeah. <laughs> right, thank just, you. I've just been buying crap on the hotel dispensary because I've been working so late every night. All right, thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Bonjour. Uh, Let's see. That's a phenomenal headpiece that you have there. Thank you. Wow, amazing. <laughs> I'm a Sunder from More Than Meets the Eye. That's awesome. Thank that you. That's awesome. Um, oh, I do have a voice for him, too. Uh, regardless. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's see. Oh, what was your favorite part about working on Transformers Prime? I heard that you worked in a big room all together, I yes. think. Yes. Yeah. Well, first of all, it's Transformers, so true, that true. alone <laughs> was enough to, you know, spark my inner fanboy. Uh, for the entire duration of the series. But getting to work with uh, Frank Welker and Peter Cullen Oof. in the oh, same yeah. room. Oh, God, my, my God. Um, yeah, just, just watching those two together because they had been friends for so many years, and yeah, it was like yeah. their reunion. Sometimes they would just go into like a, a stand-up routine doing impressions. Both of them are amazing impressionists. And we had all the suits from Hasbro watching these sessions. And usually there's a couple people from the studio there. They would line up behind the glass. We'd have 10, 15, sometimes 20 people behind the glass just because they wanted to watch the actors in the room because it was such a cool room. Um, and time is money. And usually when people are goofing around, they say, stop it and get back to work. We've got to get this done. When Frank and Peter would go off on a tangent, everybody would just stop and they'd just go like this. Yeah, yeah. More, more. <laughs> Bring it, yeah. I think Simile Montano said that same thing in the interview once. Oh, my God. It was just amazing to watch those guys. And they're, they're wonderful human beings, too. Just generous, kind, wonderful human beings. We all became family on that show. Um, and, and sometimes they would have to separate us because we'd laugh too much. Uh, <laughs> Kevin Michael Richardson sitting next to anybody. Yeah. We, it's just impossible to get anything done because he would just look at you and you'd just turn into a puddle laughing. It was ridiculous. Uh, <laughs> Nolan North in the room, uh, oh my God, uh, uh, Darren Norris, 
Darren, uh, as Knockout, uh, yeah. would sit next to me because we had a lot of scenes together. And there was one day where it was a very rare emotional scene for Starscream, where he's reflecting on his life and trying to explain away the things that he's done. And, and I see at, out of my peripheral vision, Darren is sitting next to me, and I see something wiggling. And he's got two pieces of string cheese stuck up his nose, and he, he's wagging it at me. <laughs> I can't work like this, I'm sorry. But we did, and that was one of those moments where, you know, I, it took everything in me not to just die laughing, because that, that visual, I have a picture of it, actually, and I post it from time to time. Oh, my God. That room was crazy, and the, the level of talent in that room was just astonishing. And we still stay in touch. We, we would get together for dinners occasionally. It's kind of fallen off a little bit, but I see them at conventions from time to time, and I still consider everybody in that room family. Oh, that's so sweet. Yeah. We, we love that show. It was so much fun. I suppose since I showed you one voice, I should show you my Starscream voice. Excellent. Perfect. Don't, thanks for stealing my job. I appreciate it. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Thank you very much. All right, all right. Go on, Starscream. I'll see what you started. Ah, <laughs> uh, yes. Um, <laughs> um, Approach the microphone. Take your time. I'm going to hydrate. Okay. Hydration's important. A little low on energy, John. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we're together. We're, we're kind of an aspiring voice acting duo. Yay. Isn't that right, Starstream? That's true. Nice. All I crave is Frank Walker's approval. I think that's true for everyone, though. But yeah, he'd give it to you. <laughs> uh, okay. What is your question? Oh, uh, I wanted to ask what... Um, how, what was it like? You mentioned you really like Transformers. So what was it like working on Rescue Bots? Oh, Rescue Bots was just a joy. We had so much fun. Uh, I got to do the chibi version of Wolverine on that show. Really? Oh, wait. What's, no, Rescue Bots. Sorry. I was, uh, that was uh, Superhero Squad. Transformers Rescue Bots was amazing because I got to play an Autobot. I was uh, Heat Wave on that show. And I got one of the cool lines on the show. I got to say, Rescue Bots, roll to the rescue. Yeah. It, was, it, was, it was awesome. It was a great entry point for little kids um, to the Transformers universe. And uh, also a phenomenal cast. Uh, we, we did have Frank come in to do, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Peter Cullen come in to do Optimus Prime. It's Sunday morning, you can tell, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, he would come in and do Optimus Prime from time to time. The whole cast on that show, we became really, really close. We, we text each other almost every day. It's ridiculous. Yeah. Uh, Kind of, kind of dysfunctionally ridiculous <laughs> at this point, but um, it, it was an amazing show. I mean, we had uh, everybody from brand new actors to really, really seasoned professionals, all working in the same room together, and there were no egos at all. We had Maurice LaMarche in there. We had LeVar Burton in there. I mean, it was it was crazy. Uh, Lacey Chabert, uh, and they lowered their standards to come work with us. It was amazing, <laughs> you know. <laughs> It was cool, but we, we all became a really close family, and, and I feel like it's a really uh, great show with a lot of um, wonderful little nuggets for true diehard Transformers fans so they could watch it with their kids and still enjoy it. We even did a musical episode of it. It was, it was great. I mean, that was the best one. Yeah, except they didn't give me enough to sing. Thanks a lot, guys. <laughs> <laughs> They're much better singers than I was. But, uh, yeah, thank you for watching that show. And roll to the rescue. Thank you. Hello. Hi, my, my name is Emily. Hi, Emily. I, have, I am such a huge fan of Transformers. I, I, heard, I learned about you through Prime as Starscream. Oh, thank and, you. And, I, and you just basically opened up the gateway for me to become a huge voice acting fan and a fan of like reading and learning about how the process and, the, and all the talent that goes into and all the work, and I'm really impressed. And so my question for you is, are you willing to reprise your role as Starscream or as Heatwave in a future show for like another like season or a whole new like whole new show altogether? In a heartbeat. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Oh my god. I well I'm a voiceover. I'm a voice actor. I'll do anything. So <laughs> I'm a voice whore. Yes, call me. <laughs> um no, but but truthfully that's that those shows represent some of my favorite memories in my entire career. So of course I would do it. Um, I, I love to I love to see you as like Starscream again because it's oh, such a good. Me too. I miss it so much. I miss it too. 
I really, really miss it. I, I hope that they bring the whole crew back together. If they do something like that, I hope they bring all of us back because it was such a great group. Um, and and we, the chemistry in that room, I think, has uh, contributed a lot to the success of the show. You and Darren with the cheese string on the nose was very <laughs> evident of that. God, yes, yeah. There was a lot more shenanigans like that that I can't even talk about on a Sunday morning. <laughs> but yes, yeah, thank especially you. Kevin Michael Richardson. Oh, man. Yeah, thank you Phil. so much. Thank, thank you. you. Hi. Oh. oh. Uh, so being in a lot of popular anime and video games, uh, which type of uh, voice acting do you prefer, if any, for like, anime or voice or a video game? All of it. All of it, um, and that, that's really true. I, the one wonderful thing about doing this work and being able to cross over into so many mediums is that I get to do something different every day. I never get bored. So uh, my least favorite thing would probably be commercials just because uh, you know, I'm selling a product, in, unless it's this product that I really love. Uh, it's, a, it's a little hard for me to, to put on the happy face and make it extra smiley or super delicious, you know? Um, sometimes that's hard, and also I think people are a little more precious about commercials. I'll probably never get hired for a commercial again after saying this. But, <laughs> but a lot of times, you know, you go into a room and, and there are people who are just trying to justify their positions and they want you to pronounce the word the 16 different ways just so they feel like they're getting their money's worth out of you when they know they got it on the first take. So in that respect, they're a little more tedious. Um, I, I love uh, original animation, I think the best just because we do get to be in the room with our friends and we get to goof around and create something out of thin air uh, and work off of each other's energy. That, to me, is the most fun of all. Anime is, will always be home for me. That's where I'm probably most comfortable because I am a little bit uh, shy sometimes and I, I, I kind of like to be by myself. Uh, so I, I like the security of that rubber room and just being able to do my thing and, and crank through it. Um, but I love every every part of it. Video games I love too. Sometimes that can be a little taxing on the throat, just, you know, especially for things like Call of Duty, where, you know, I'm, I'm just screaming for hours. Uh, that can hurt after a while. Uh, and especially if we're doing a thousand lines and you have to do three takes of every line, uh, that can be pretty rough. Uh, but honestly, I love every aspect of voice acting, even the auditions. Um, and I, I tell my students I'm teaching now at bloomboxstudios.com. <laughs> Uh, online, but I, one of the things that I tell my students all the time is that you have to love every bit of it, and you have to put as much uh, into the audition as you would into the paying job, because that really is the job. You have to love doing it and creating the characters from scratch, no matter what you are asked to do. That, that's the gig. So if you don't love that, you might want to consider doing something else. Mm -hmm. but, but thank you for asking that question. And also, I'm really excited to see the rest of you in uh, Guild Wars for Living World Season 5. Oh, thanks. Thanks for playing. Mm -hmm. For the char. Hi. Hi. Um, so, one of my favorite shows ever is Ben 10. And nice. And I want to know what it was like to work on that show. Oh, man, my butt's on fire. <laughs> I, I love that show. Uh, it made me sad that they kind of kicked me out of the show. They, that show went through so many different permutations. Um, the original version of that, I think, was my favorite, just because the I thought the storytelling was really fun. Um, the cast was awesome. Not that the casts aren't awesome on the, the later incarnations of that show, and I worked on a couple of them. Um, but that first version of it was really fun and really clever and felt like something new and different. And we worked at Cartoon Network in the studio there. Uh, it was just awesome being there. That was my first, I think, my first big show where I was at Cartoon Network, other than Megas XLR. Um, for something that was just new and original and, and fun. Um, I miss that. I really miss that, that cast. It was great. And, and they gave me some great characters, too. Ghost Freak! It was, yeah, it was really cool, awful, crazy characters. It was, it was fun. Thank you for watching. Thank you. Bless you. <laughs> Bless you. Hi there. Hi. Um, so I've heard through the grapevine about your wonderful teaching series called Bloombox Studios. Yes. If you haven't checked it out, you should. Um, <laughs> Thank you. Did you, but, uh, Thank you. Did you the, pay the, her? I, I have cash. It's okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll take care of you later. Um, but what I wanted to know that I, I haven't really been able to hear much from the series or even interviews is um, what was maybe one of the most rewarding things you've gotten from becoming just a voice actor yourself to becoming a teacher? Like a surprising, maybe rewarding experience that you've gotten from becoming what I think is a phenomenal teacher. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah, that, that all happened kind of accidentally. I, I found that 
a lot of panels sort of became teaching moments anyway, uh, as I was doing these things around the world. And my team has been bugging me to teach for eight, 10 years now, and I didn't want to do it because it's hard. For you teachers, I have so much respect for you. Thank you for what you do, because it's really hard. And, and the, the hardest thing for me was to deconstruct what got me here over the last 30 years, because I wasn't classically trained. I didn't know how I do what I do. And it caused me to have to go and do research on myself and, and the process that, uh, that got me here. And, and to be able to break that down in a meaningful way for my students. I think the thing that surprised me the most was that I spend a lot of time uh, talking about uh, self-confidence, feeling good in your own skin, discovering your, your own unique version of you, the most authentic version of you, rather than on a lot of the other typical acting things. It's really um, self-empowerment and finding your place in the world and knowing that you have a place in the world and that everybody's got a superpower. That was the thing that surprised me most because I found that was the motivating thing for me to do this in the first place. Um, and I, and I love that, because I was, I was bullied, I was insecure, I never thought I was good at anything. I was maybe average at best at anything until I started doing this. And then I realized, oh, this is something that makes me feel good. And so I wanted to share that. I really wanted to share that. And that was my primary motivation for doing this. And the other thing that really bothered me out there was when people said they wanted to learn uh, how to become a voice actor, there are plenty of people out there that are willing to take their money that really don't do this for a living. And they would promise them things. They would promise them gigs. They would promise them auditions. And I just, I hate predators. And because I was bullied, I will fight predators for the rest of my life. And so one of the ways, yeah, one of the one of the ways that I thought I could do that was to offer them something real. I would come in from a session just bleary-eyed and, and scratchy-throated, and I would tell them the truth. And that's how I started my classes, and that's how I continue my classes. And I wanted to offer something also that people could do from anywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, a, it's an online course, as you know, uh, on Zoom format, uh, free app. There's a lot of free stuff on my website, so if you're not ready to to actually get into it and pay for uh, instruction in this. There's a lot of free stuff, so you can just try it out. There are lots of free tips and tricks and exercises and things. I want people to make educated decisions when they spend money in their life, because I made a lot of uneducated <laughs> decisions in terms of spending money. Um, so I wanted to give really, really great value for it. And the other thing that I get to do now is to ask all my friends to come in. With the first 30 classes that we did, uh, I set up a curriculum, and I, it was kind of curriculum-based, and I tried to cover everything that I could think of to help people on their journey. Now I get to bring in the best of the best of the industry. So I, I brought like, in. who's coming on Tuesday? We have Kari Walgren coming on Tuesday night. Um, yeah, and we're going to be doing it live uh, It'll be 8.30 your time here. Um, and I have cards at my table if you guys are interested in, in checking it out. And there are discount things available now for the classes too. Um, but we've had Rob Paulson, we've had Dee Bradley Baker, we've had Bob, Bob Bergen, voice of Porky Pig. We had Eliza Jane Schneider, who's a dialect expert. Um, Mary Elizabeth McLean, I'm gonna talk about her again. Cause she's one of the great, honestly, she's one of the greatest voice directors in the world. And, and we have a lot more amazing people who are coming down the pipe too. So. Uh, I hope if you're re even remotely interested in voice acting, that you at least check out the website so that you're not steered in the wrong direction. I'm going to at least point you in the right direction. And if my class isn't right for you, I'll tell you whose is. I will help you with that because we're all friends and we care about each other and I don't want you to get taken advantage of. So it's supposed to be fun. Well, thank you for stepping outside of your bubble and creating such a wonderful program. So thank you very thank much. Thank you. It's still really hard and I don't make any money at it, but it's okay. It's, maybe someday. Now we're, almost, we're almost out of time here, so we only got a couple questions left. Uh, so we'll try to get through as many as possible before we have to get okay. out of here. All right. So, uh, Speed right. round. I'll try, right. I'll try to make these questions quick. Um, I wanted to know, uh, I'm sure for most people here, our introduction to you as a voice actor was Cowboy Bebop, Spike Spiegel. Um, did any of them, when they're doing this live action production, did John Cho or like anybody, um, did John Cho specifically reach out to you at all? And, get any tips or advice from you on the role of Spike Spiegel, or did they actually reach out to you at all, anybody from the production team on any, you know, kind of tips or anything like Nope. <laughs> they didn't care. No, I stalked John. I actually, I, I hit him up on Twitter just to congratulate him, and he actually responded. Um, 
But no, they, they know what they're doing. They've got Watsonabe on there. Uh, you know, the creator of the show is, I think he's executive producer or something. And he's the go-to guy. I'm just the voice schmuck, you know? <laughs> and John, I think, is going to do his own take on it, which I think is healthy. Um, you know, sometimes actors consult each other if they're going to be uh, taking over a role, but I, I think it's actually better that he does his own take on it. And I trust, he's a great actor. I trust that he's going to do something really interesting and really make it his own, and, and that's what I want him to do. I don't want him to, to try to copy me or anything. That'd be just silly. Um, you know, if, if, but if they want my advice, I'll be ready and willing to give it to them. Uh, right. As a consultant or floor mopper or old man or anything they want me to do, I'll do it. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, hi. Hi. Uh, so uh, I'm like a big fan of Star Wars Rebels, and you play the character of Zeb. And uh, were you a big fan of Star Wars at all? And was it like a dream come true to actually be a part of the universe at all? God, dude, I'm geeking out about it just as you're talking about it right now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I've been a fan of Star Wars since 1977. I was a, an apathetic teen just coming out of high school and hated everything and everyone. And I sat in that theater and saw the, the, crew, the destroyer coming over head and hearing THX sound for the first time. You guys are so spoiled. We didn't have that back then. Mm -hmm. And I just went, oh my God, I care about something again. <laughs> and so I've been a Star Wars fan forever. And, and getting to work in the games, I worked in the games for a long time before I got that show. And every time they would bring me in to play any character, even if it was just a stormtrooper with a five second lifespan, I, I just I silently went, I get to work on Star Wars. This is so awesome. So, yeah, man, getting to work on a character that's actually derived from a, a, Ra a Ralph McQuarrie design for the original Wookiee, yeah. which is what Zeb was, yeah. um, and to develop that character with Dave Filoni and that crew from Lucas, it's, it is a dream come true, and it, I think about it all the time. They, they, they brought us to Lucasfilm to meet everybody at ILM and Lucasfilm, and I got to stay on Skywalker Ranch. Ooh. I mean, dude, I can't even tell you my... my my, uh, the hairs on the back of my neck are just standing up now because it, it makes my geek flag fly just thinking about it. So thank you and may the force be with you. All right, thank you.